We've all had that moment where you're watching Legally Blonde and you see the cute orange iBook and you think to yourself, I wonder if Steve Jobs ever ruined a building so badly it had to be torn down. What a niche and specific question. Yes, he did. It was also wrapped up in a legal battle so complicated, only Elle Woods could make sense of it. But I will try my hardest, Your Honor. Today we're talking about the Jackling House, a large Spanish colonial revival in Woodside, California, built in 1926 by George Washington Smith. He was an architect born on George Washington's birthday and he got his name in return. So call me Adam Sandler Gaylord and let me take you on the journey of this house. To be able to afford a 30 room mansion, you need a pretty penny. And you might make those pennies by finding new ways to mine copper. Daniel Jackling, who commissioned this house, went to school for metallurgy, which sounds like a cool witch thing, but it just means metal science. And he was one of the people who brought mining from this to this. And you won't believe how they did it. They dug a really big hole. I sure hope it doesn't have any environmental ramifications. It does. I'll get more into how Jacqueline got rich rich, but first let's break into this house. Not literally, someone else will do that for us later. California was doing the Spanish colonial style before it was part of the United States. You might recognize the style for its low pitched tile roofs, thick stucco walls, external doors, and small windows. When Spain was colonizing Mexico and California, places with similar climates, the influence on the architecture was palpable. But like all popular things, at some point it became less popular. And I wonder if someone could write a very cool academic article about Spanish colonial architecture falling out of favor after the Mexican-American War and the impending westward expansion which brought a lot more English colonial influences to the West. But this is an essay about a man who made an iPod, so I fear I've gone a little off track. Like many things that go out of style, there are comebacks. And that's the case for the Spanish colonial revival. Now cue our leading architect, George Washington Smith. He was close to the epicenter of the Spanish colonial revival. His work didn't just come up once in my personal Bible, A Field Guide to American Houses. It came up twice. He was kind of a big deal because between 1917 and 1930, he was going to town on Spanish colonial revivals in Santa Barbara. And he also went north to do a little mansion in Woodside, California, which Steve Jobs would later call the ugliest house in the world. And although we're supposed to trust his design aesthetic, let's keep in mind that he did design this hockey puck mouse. But let's see the house for ourselves. There are outdoor pavilions, romantic balconies, arch doors and it feels so integrated between the outside space and the inside space. Now I think he might have been trying to get his way on this one because this house is pretty inarguably beautiful. This isn't even my favorite style of architecture, but it's pretty clear that this is a good example. Before I tell you how this house went from this to this, I want to tell you more about the man who originally commissioned it, Daniel Jackling. While we're looking at aerial photos, Look at this open pit mine that Daniel Jackling helped build. You can see it from space. This is Bingham Canyon Mine, the largest open pit mine in the world. And it's also a super fun site. Oh, sorry, I meant super fun site, meaning it requires federal intervention for an environmentally hazardous location. It was Jackling who innovated the way that copper was acquired with railroad pit operations and steam shovels. The mine is still in operation today, which explains why it is the biggest and deepest open pit mine in the world. And he wasn't done there. He built more mines, one in Nevada, later one in Alaska, and then ran an explosives plant during World War I in Nitro, West Virginia, which would later become a super fun site. Oh, sorry, again, a super fun site. It's kind of rude for me to connect that to him because it didn't become a problem until much later. He was actually long dead. The location was taken over by a chemical plant who you know, swept some sodium coolant under the rug, a World War I bunker. Daniel Jackling got praise for producing tons of copper. And although copper might just feel like a material for pennies, it was electrifying all of the United States. And during World War I, copper had become an essential part of the war effort. The American Institute of Metals Trade Journal said at the time, quote, it is almost impossible to kill a man in an up-to-date and scientific way without using copper. 
Copper was needed for weapons, tanks, airplanes, and submarines. And the U.S. was a major exporter. Copper prices rose three times from the start of the war to when the U.S. entered. And this wasn't unnoticed by the press. In 1915, before the U.S. was in the war, a weekly Salt Lake City paper was reporting on the comings and goings of wealthy people who were connected to Utah. It was around this time that Daniel Jackling was courting his soon-to-be wife, Miss Virginia Joliffe. They describe an expensive week at the San Diego Exposition that included guests, yachts, private cars, and apartments. But it's the last line that feels like a little bit of a wink and a nod to where this wealth was coming from. Quote, he has a genuine gift for having a good time and sharing it with others instead of allowing his vast affairs to entirely engross his time. When a copper magnate can frolic through the war, considering what it has done to copper, everyone else ought to be able to sit up and have a good time. To be sure, Mr. Jackling has a few gold mines too, when you're a copper magnate and frolicking through the war. After the war and his management of that explosives plant in West Virginia, Daniel Jackling got a Distinguished Service Medal from Woodrow Wilson. So after the war, Jackling is married and in his mid-50s, he and his wife commissioned George Washington Smith to build their house, along with a later addition. The interior included a pipe organ and tile murals and a copper mailbox. They lived there for about 30 years until his wife died and he moved out. Three other owners would live in the home and are a reason so many great before photos exist of the house. But in 1984, Steve Jobs bought this house and he lived in it for a decade. There's even a photo of him and his coworkers in front of it in a Newsweek article from 1985. An original Macintosh designer described what he saw when he came to visit him. Quote, we knocked on the door and waited a few minutes before Steve appeared and led us inside. The massive house was almost completely unfurnished and our footsteps echoed eerily as he led us to a larger room near the kitchen with a long table, one of the few rooms that had any furniture. After getting married, Steve Jobs moved to Palo Alto and rented out this mansion in Woodside. Also, the Secret Service stayed in this house when Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were here visiting, I think to see Stanford for their daughter. In 2000, he stopped maintaining the mansion, but kept the upkeep of the grounds. In 2001, the town's history committee reported that doors had been taken out of the door frames and windows were gone. These were exterior doors and windows. So plants had started growing inside. He needed permission to tear down the house from a committee. His initial request was rejected. Then he received permission in 2004, but then a group of preservationists stopped his campaign saying that he should move the house for its historical record. This long legal battle meant that Steve Jobs was speaking on the record about this house. So let's do a roundup of the meanest things Steve Jobs said about a house. One of the biggest abominations of a house I've ever seen of Jackling, he was a very wealthy man. Unfortunately, he didn't have very good taste. It's extremely poorly built and falling apart. He said that although he had studied architecture, he had never heard of George Washington Smith. His lawyer said, the second story bedrooms are dark and narrow and resemble a Motel 6. It was never really a very interesting house to start with. Pretty much a dump when I moved in. But considering he had been an owner of the house for 20 years, it makes you wonder how dumpy it really was. Some of the photos from the past look pretty nice. And as the legal battle ensued, we're lucky enough to have photos of what the house had been transformed to. And it's got real Last of Us energy. A photographer and urban explorer, Jonathan Haber, saw an opportunity to photograph the home in 2006 and came back again and again over a six month period. He talked to the New York Post later about what he saw. I sort of discovered I could walk through the front door. It was eerie, almost like Steve Jobs was inviting people there. When they don't have permission to demolish a house, they want people trespassing because it would lead to vandalism. It was about urgency and excitement. This is the last chance that I will have to capture something and no one else could do it. It was an important historical record of Steve Jobs because there were personal items. He saw many of those personal items were on their way to the dumpster and he memorialized them in photos. He said he found an early will and testament in the kitchen, along with a VCR tape of The Godfather Part Two, and an article from Newsweek entitled The Whiz Kids Fall, which from what I've gathered is the same article this photo was published in. Now I mentioned an organ that was built in the home's extension in 1930. When Haber photographed it, it looked to be in bad condition, but it got worse. In 2011, before the home was demolished, a small team of organ enthusiasts 
the this type of organ, not the this type, came together to try and save it. And they succeeded. They built 66 trays to safely store all of the organ pipes. They documented their process on a now gone blog, but thanks to the Wayback Machine, we can see the photos of two very hardworking men figuring out how to remove 3,816 pipes and the blower and the regulator and the motor for this organ all in two weekends. They knew that the organ would have water damage, but when they came to see it, they saw that there was a fire lit, had been lit inside the keys. One of their photos shows the outside of where one of the organ chambers was. And it also happens to show the outside of the house in 2011. You can see why the court finally allowed Steve Jobs to demolish the house. After being left to rot for 10 years, it would have been a huge undertaking to ever bring it back to life or even to move it to somewhere else, especially with such an inhospitable owner. The organ was salvaged, as were some lights, tiles, other items that were put on display at the Woodside Community Museum and now have been put up for auction. In December 2004, when he made an in-person appearance to the town council meeting, he seemed ready for a long fight saying that if they didn't grant him permission, he would just wait and try again. A councilwoman asked, are you trying to wear us down? He replied, I think the elements will wear the house down. And they did. The house was torn down in February, 2011, and he died eight months later. His wife went on to get permission to build a smaller rectangular looking house sometime around 2017. And the copper magnates mansion is now a bunch of trees. But if you know a place that needs a really big organ or like 3,816 pipes, it seems to still be in storage according to the pipe organ database. When you like history and old things like myself, you find yourself in the wreckage of rich people's lives. Just like the fancy dollhouses from my last video, the rich often have a place for things to get old safely while they wait for it to come back in style. Expensive neighborhoods rarely have highways built through them. But the same wealth that creates this opulence is competitive with itself. They have the money to buy a nice pipe organ and maintain it for a hundred years, but the next rich person might despise organs. Someday people will be fighting to preserve Apple stores. And I wonder if anyone will intentionally take off the doors and the windows and watch the elements wear it down. Houses and buildings are temporary, but the mining pits will be super fun forever. Thank you for watching this video. If you like architecture, you're invited to my digital house, which is this channel. And to get the keys, you just need to subscribe. I talk about houses and pop culture. If you feel at home in an Apple store, check out my video on Edward Cullen's Modern House in Twilight. It is one of my favorite videos. And if you've made it this far, I think you'd like it too. And I love chatting in the comments. So please tell me your thoughts on this house, Steve Jobs, Spanish colonial revivals, copper. Bye. I'm so warm. <laughs> it's way too warm in here. Goodbye.